I will be reading from Acts 19, verses 20, uh, 11 through 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all of the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. All right. Thank you, Alessia. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, that was quite the passage that uh, Alessia just read for us. You know, for modern people, this passage with the astounding healings and the wild exorcism and the dramatic book burning is pretty striking, right? Um, this is especially true, I think, for those of us who are in the West. So we, we, we call that, you know, Europe or North America, because we tend to be the most secularized parts of the world. And so we've cultivated this worldview that minimizes or even disbelieves uh, in the possibility of a spiritual realm that is animated in these ways that the passage describes. So we should recognize, I guess, however, that, um, you know, if we were in other parts of the world, India or Africa or South America, people would not be so skeptical against the possibility of the kind of spiritual dynamic that takes place in this passage. So, in fact, you can imagine that if you were a force of spiritual evil, the Bible talks about that as Satan and, and all who are uh, under the leadership and the framework of Satan, um, one of your best strategies would be to keep people from thinking that there isn't, even is a spiritual realm. Uh, C.S. Lewis makes this point in the famous book, The Screwtape Letters, in which you have a mentoring um, demon tutor working with a pupil who's then tormenting the main character of the book. And uh, in that uh, dynamic, the, the mentor tutor demon says to the pupil demon, our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves, right? You can imagine how many people would reconsider their atheism if all the naturalists and materialists in the West suddenly witnessed an unmistakably spiritual event like the kind described in the passage that we read this morning. And so it's in the best interest of the spiritual forces of darkness to keep us blind to their existence on some level. So with all that, that's sort of a preamble, uh, acknowledging it. Here's what happens in the events that Luke recounts in this passage. And it's, it's what I would call a window into the spiritual realm. Paul continues to minister out of a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about how uh, that works. And so if you're interested more in exploring that, you can listen to last week. And how it makes sense, especially within the framework of the gospel of the kingdom. In fact, the Holy Spirit is one of Luke's main themes. The book of Acts begins with the unleashing of the Holy Spirit upon the followers of Jesus during an event that's called Pentecost. That's when the Spirit descends on the people of God and they have these tongues of fire and they start speaking in many languages so that the gospel can go forward 
to the multi-ethnic group of people that's in Jerusalem at that time. They're hearing the gospel in their own unique language. And so this empowerment of the Holy Spirit is for that proclamation of the gospel to the all peoples, to the different ethnic groups that are present there. And then Paul continues uh, after that. Well, first we have to learn how Paul comes to faith, which we do in the book of Acts. But then he continues in the power of that same Holy Spirit. And here it's reached a remarkable level, right? Uh, you know, there, there's uh, people just touching the handkerchief or the apron that has touched Paul and they're being healed. And I want you to remember that in, you know, if this, if this sounds even more strange than what we've already been looking at, you know, this is this moment when the gospel is so new, it stands to reason that there would be a special sort of accompanying power as it goes out so that people would sit up and listen. They would pay attention to what's happening. And that's what seems to be taking place with Paul as the Holy Spirit is upon him in this special power and he is able to have this incredible impact. Now, you know, during that time, there was a heightened awareness to all things spiritual, different than probably the era that we live in. As I described, our secular environment very much diminishes these spiritual things in many respects. And so it's not surprising that there were these Jewish exorcists who were also going around, roaming around and uh, doing exorcisms. And they, they hear uh, about Paul and they mistakenly think that this Jesus name is another tool that they can just put in their quiver so that they can do better at exercising demons from people. Um, like we've been saying over and over though, uh, Jesus is not uh, an idea that is true, Jesus is a person who is the truth. And so connecting to him is not just assenting to a particular idea, it's actually having a relationship with him through faith. And, and we've talked over the last weeks and ongoingly, we will continue, that if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, it happens by faith. The, the, the right and natural response to the work of God in the world through the person of Jesus Christ is faith. And, and we often talk about that being faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So that captures sort of two of the primary elements that he went to the cross to die on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And so we put our trust in Jesus as Savior and we are forgiven for our sin and also as Lord, meaning he's the one now that's going to set the direction of our lives. We are going to order everything that we think and do and how we behave uh, with his help around his lordship. And so faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is how a relationship with God is conducted according to the scriptures. And these exorcists had none of that. They just had the name of Jesus that they were proclaiming as they went about their work. And apparently that relationship with Jesus is integral to there being any sort of power because when they try to exorcise a demon using the name of Jesus, the demon jumps on them, all seven of them, calls them out for not actually being associated with Jesus and proceeds to pummel them to the point that they run off naked. Apparently, uh, knowing Jesus makes you identifiable to the demons. And they didn't know Jesus, and so they were unidentifiable. I wish we had more time to kind of follow that thread because it's an interesting idea. According to this text, there are lots of people in the world who are being left alone by evil forces because they don't pose a threat to evil because they're not close to Jesus. So in other words, the demon understands who people are in proximity to Christ. Their, their allegiance, though somebody who's far from, has already been secured. So they don't pose a threat. We could go deeper on that one, but, but there's just so much in this text. Let me move on. The seven sons run away naked, which apparently leaves a huge impression on all of the people of Ephesus, the Jews and the Greeks. And because they all come and, and confess their evil spiritual practices and burn their magic books. And if you were to put the value of all those books that they burned in today's terms, it would add up to about $5 million. So this was no insignificant thing that happened in Ephesus as a result of this incredible power encounter between Jesus and Paul and these exorcists and everybody who's watching. People are seeing where the real power is, and they respond accordingly. And Luke summarizes what's happening in this way. He says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail 
mightily. The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Remember, we've talked about the word of the Lord uh, recently and how important it is that the word of truth is intertwining with our lives in deep and consistent ways. And, and this is where the power is. is and, and we don't want to forfeit that as the church. I prayed earlier that we would be a church that's you know, effective in the world. And, and when we commingle with other beliefs that run contrary to what the scripture, to what the word teaches, then we, we diminish or water down or, or render ineffective that work. And so you see that dynamic playing itself out. There really is a spiritual realm. And we may have a hard time understanding that in our modern context. But this t- scripture teaches that. People other, in other parts of the world would see that readily. Uh, and, and so it matters. We need a window into that spiritual realm. And that's what this passage is. It gives us a window into the dynamics that are often taking place behind the scenes. And so let's ask that question, you know, are these just dusty old stories with no relevance or do these things happen in our day? And I'd say that they do happen in our day in more ways than we even begin to understand. Now, um, the enemy is crafty, right? And so we oftentimes don't see how these dynamics are playing themselves out in our world. And I've got two examples that I want to work through with you this morning. One would be from what we would call the political and the cultural right. And one would de- be from what we would, we would oftentimes call the political or the cultural left. Although I personally am never very satisfied with those terms and I'm not very satisfied with the partisan uh, the polarization that's happening in our country in our day. And so, but those are terms that are being used quite a bit. And of course, media and others are pushing us often into those. So, so let me dr- address a couple of things. And I'm using these examples because they show how these powerful biblical teachings help us to sort through all these voices, these bellowing voices all around us. Um, as we're, we're, we're locked up in our houses and all we have is this little portal through which we see the world, oftentimes our screen, computer screen, or our phone. We have this multitude of voices that's coming to us and, and we're trying to figure out what's happening and so we're searching and searching and searching. And, and, and how, do, how do we sort out all the voices that are coming at us. Secondly, these examples may serve to help us as Christians to stop aligning ourselves wholesale with the political and cultural right and the left. This is something that I addressed in a sermon earlier this year on politics, and I'm pressing into it a little bit this morning, and I hope you'll go with me. I hope you will listen carefully because I've chosen my words carefully Uh, And we can have a discussion afterwards, but I hope you will listen carefully. I want to press us beyond the polarization of our current moment and the culture in which we live out of the right and left columns and to think about the third party, the kingdom party, the party of the kingdom of God that we as Christians are first and foremost part of. That is our primary allegiance. And so often what happens in our world is we, we allow ourselves to be pressed into right and to left categories and then we buy wholesale, lock, stock, and barrel all the beliefs on one side and we end up assenting to things that, dis, that, that conflict with what we with actually believe from our allegiance to the kingdom party. We get pushed around and we need to press back on that as a church. And that's what I'm pressing into this morning. I hope you will, with grace, go with me down what I think will be some challenging uh, paths this morning. The people of the third party, right? That's us. We engage with and we critique and we improve, hopefully, Lord willing, the two parties, politically and culturally, that exist, but without ever wholesale giving ourselves over to either one of them. We're owned by God. And the kingdom party is our primary allegiance. So let me dive right in. My example number one, my first example illustrates a contemporary version of the seven sons of Siva. Seven sons of Siva, those are the ones who were trying to do the exorcism and it didn't work because they didn't actually know Jesus. And it has to do with our current president, President Trump. Now let me say up front, I'm not attempting to tell anyone how to vote. 
Uh, the work of comparing policies, you know, we're in this heavy political season coming up to uh, a, a, an election, and the work of comparing policies of the two different options and deciding which is best is complicated, and it's personal, and there are spiritual dynamics within that as well. And I expect we'll have people who love Jesus and end up on either side of that question. And I know even that fact can be upsetting to some, but it's also a refle reflection of the fact that what we have to hold us together is something greater than, than politics or anything else. We have to have something greater than that to hold us together. And we do in the person of Jesus Christ. And I hope and, and dream for a day when in this community we can have hard conversations about true things while maintaining a love for one another. Anyway, uh, with that sort of caveat, let me, let me just say this. If what Jesus says is true, that you will know them by their fruits, okay, President Trump shows very little fruit of having a sincere relationship with Jesus. President Trump does not repent nor appear to believe in repentance, which, as we said last week, is essential. Paul said this last week to a relationship with God. He has not repented of his having had three wives, not of his hateful words towards women, not of his support of white supremacists, not of his lying, nor to my knowledge of any other sin he has committed. And he shows very little knowledge of the Bible and seems not to attend church or ever to have been a meaningful part of a church community. In fact, the church that he grew up in was not a gospel preaching church. And yet he claims to be a Christian and clearly uses the invocation of Christianity of the name of Jesus for political advantage. Obviously not the first politician to have done this. But like with the seven sons, the name of Jesus is a tool in his hands. He invokes the name of Jesus and says to Christians, with me, you will have power. Now, a person may still prefer him to the alternative. Listen carefully to me. And I say that genuinely. But let's make sure we're not being spiritually manipulated by one who invokes the name of Jesus, but does not appear to have any meaningful relationship with him. Let's keep an appropriate distance from that which we cannot support because of our faith. Let's not allow the cultural wars in our society right now to press us into believing and holding on to things that are contrary to our faith. Now, I know I'm going to upset just about everybody this morning. So example number two. My second example is from the political and cultural left. And I would say, you know, again, this issue transcends that. I don't like those categories, but we got to deal with them because they're a part of our reality right now. And let me just make clear that what I'm about to say in no way diminishes my resolve to fight against the sin of racism in our day. I'm committed to that fight for two reasons. Let me just be really clear with you why I'm committed to that fight. Um, the God of the Bible is the God of all people, from creation to redemption to consummation. And through Jesus, he pursues all people as image bearers meant for redemption. We are his treasured, all of us, his treasured possession, his beloved. And right now, we have an open window at this moment to dismantle the human construct of race and the racism that accompanies it. And we haven't had this in my lifetime that I can remember. A willingness to go there and have the conversation that needs to be had. Okay. But it's messy. The conversation is messy. And we need to enter the messy. We need to have a real and thoughtful conversation. We need to discern how some of the dynamics of this passage are at play. In particular, I'm thinking of how the people, once they saw the power of God, disavowed themselves of the magic and they burned the books that uh, taught them the magic arts. So the phrase, Black Lives Matter, is one that I've used. And I believe down to the core of my being, um, Black Lives Matter. And I say that without reservation. Um, and I think it's such a good phrase in the way that it's framed because it's a counterweight to the awful history going back to slavery and extending, you know, all the way to now against the societal belief, which has been expressed in myriad ways, that black lives don't matter or that they matter less. 
our society, going back to slavery and to this day, said that in myriad ways over and over again. And in our series on race, we chronicled some of the ways in which that has been true. So the phrase is good. But as Christians, we need to sort this out a little bit, right? We should be aware that the organization Black Lives Matter is different from what we might believe. It, it differs from our Christian beliefs. The founders of the organization Black Lives Matter are not Christian. No surprise, um, given the prevailing views of the American church's relationship to racism in our day. What do they believe? Well, matter of, fact, matter of factly, their beliefs are rooted in a pagan religion which includes elements of ancestor worship. Here I am moving into this, this space where the text is taking us. Um, and the view that by saying someone's name, you're calling them up and deriving power from their presence. They've stated that very explicitly. Now, from a biblical perspective, this is exactly the kind of magic arts which is being referred to in this passage. We have an example of this in the Old Testament when Saul loses his last battle and his life for practicing this very kind of, of magic art, for calling up, you know, the deceased. And the church can't afford to weaken itself by participating in that kind of work. But here's where it gets messy in, in my mind. We ought to say the names of people who have been unjustly killed, not because they will come back and help us, but because as fellow image bearers, they matter. Their lives matter and their death matters. So I will say their names. See, this is the, this is the complicated part. I will say their names in that way. Names like Daniel Prude or George Floyd or Breonna, Breonna Taylor or Ahmed Arbery because they all matter to God. They matter to God. But we should not allow the work to commingle us with beliefs that are contrary to our faith. And that will weaken us in our work. God's already given us the greatest reason and the greatest power to fight against the sin of racism. We already have that. We don't need anything else. We have in the Bible the heart of God, which is that his creation and his redemption and the consummation of all things is for all people. It's for all people. And the Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us in the work answering the call of God. We don't need to conjure up anybody else. So why is this so important? Well, spiritually, there's so much complexity to what's happening all around us right now. It is super messy. It's full of nuance, and yet we are constantly being pushed into the binary right and left categories. Either you embrace all on one side, or you embrace all on the other side. And that is a false dichotomy. That has the potential to, potential to lead us into grave spiritual trouble because it can lead us to agree with things that are contrary to our faith. When we have to buy the whole side, one side or the other, it leads us into agreement with things that are contrary to our faith. We ultimately belong to a different side, the kingdom side. And from the, that place, from the place our residents in the kingdom party, we speak prophetic critique against both of the polarized options present in our world today. We are salt and light in the multiplicity, multiplicity of environments, right? There's all kinds of environments, and Christians are to be present in them to be salt and light as Jesus taught us. We may be present in one or another, but we only ever belong to the kingdom of God. Our allegiance is only ever to the kingdom of God. And it's within that framework that we can then have a real conversation about where we agree and where we disagree with what's happening in our world, right? We don't have to be pushed one side to the other, but we can have a real conversation. And then we're going to have to make some hard choices. When it comes time to, to vote, we got to make some hard choices, or maybe it's not a hard choice in your mind. I'm just saying there has to be a space where because of our allegiance to the kingdom, we are able 
to have real conversation. And the more and more that we live into that, lean into that, the more effective and the more um, Christ-centered we're going to become. How do we continue to see ourselves as ambassadors from um, the third kingdom, representing its views and ideas? That's the last question here, and I have two, two quick thoughts on that. First of all, work on your relationship with Jesus. The difference between Paul and the seven sons of Siva was a relationship with Jesus. That's the difference. It was real for Paul. It was vibrant. It was rooted in repentance and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you can have that daily. That's what the scripture teaches. If you come humbly before Jesus, emptying yourself by resisting the temptation to manipulate God for your purposes and by becoming a vessel of his presence. And then intertwine your life with the word of God. We've been saying this over and over again. Let me see if I can try and say this maybe even a little bit more clearly than I've been able to say it in the past. Satan operates in lies and God operates in truth. That's just the way it is. If it's lies, it's on the side of the enemy. If it's truth, it's on the side of God. Even the hard truths, even the difficult truths, God works them into the reality over which he has sovereign power, okay? Satan, ever since the very beginning in the garden, his goal was to twist things and to make us think differently than what was real. Now, how do you, how do you live out that dynamic in the context in which we find ourselves? Because there is no news source, right, or media outlet or social media influencer who is always going to give you the truth. There's none. None of those will always give you the truth. And yet we give ourselves, you know, up to 90 hours a week to them and maybe two hours a week to the Word of God. And yet those, we, we have very little certainty oftentimes whether they're giving us the truth. As someone recently said, your search bar has become a battleground. And that's true. And, and because you have that little search bar, okay, the, the Bible talks about us as sheep, Right? Not very um, affirming, but that's what we are. We're sheep. And it talks about wolves coming in and talking to the sheep and drawing the sheep astray. The search bar is, is a spiritual battleground. We are exposed to millions of wolves, if you want to think of it that way, each and every day because we have this little search bar on our phone or on our computer. And, and, and so we're exposed to all of this information, all of this uh, possibility of things that are untrue. Um, and, and so how do you deal with that? That's one of the key questions that we're grappling with as a society right now. What is truth? We've talked about this over the last weeks. And how do we discern what's actually happening? And this is at the core of a lot of these questions, whether it be political questions or anything else, or how we address the pandemic. What is really true? What's really going on? Well, our best strategy, in my view, is to learn to recognize truth and lies by being so soaked in the Word of God that you can discern it on your own. You, you have to be so soaked in the Word of God, so familiar with the character of God, so dialed in to the person of Jesus Christ, that you have the ability, increasingly, to discern what is true and what is not true. It's just like how we want to teach our kids, right? We don't say to our kids, um, you know, I, I want you to know what to, th I, I want to tell you what to think. You say to your kids, I want to teach you how to think so that when you come across, across problems that you haven't encountered before, you have the ability to discern the right way forward. And God does, we're the children of God. He does the same thing with us. He doesn't want to just provide somebody for us to give us all the answers. He wants to teach us how to think, how to discern. And the way that happens is by understanding the character of God and by taking on board that character in of ourselves. And so the process of learning to discern has to involve this incredibly important discipleship walk where we just soak in the word of God so that we can discern what is right and true, and what is not right and true as we're moving through this incredibly complicated world. And then I would just say on top of that, 
you know, first of all, soak in the word of God daily, regularly. I think this is a season in which we need to go more into the word of God, not less. And so if before the pandemic started and this heavy political season and the racial reckoning season and the economic downturn and the fires and the heat wave, if before all this started, you were reading your Bible X, now read your Bible 2X, okay? Or 3X. You've got more time in some cases to do that. Use it. If, if you're spending 10 times the time you would have spent in your Bible scrolling through the Instagram feed, looking at anybody who says they're an expert but has no accountability, then you are making yourself susceptible to lies. Dig deep into the Word of God and let this shape your perspective. And then when you do read, when you look to outside sources, look for sources that have accountability, right? When somebody publishes a book, Usually, at least in the past, there's a sense in which that book has to go through some rigorous challenge through editorial process to make sure that the claims can be justified. There's none of that on social media. None of that on social media. So what you read there, oftentimes, is coming from somebody who doesn't have much accountability. Even if they have letters behind their name, whatever it is. We need to be looking to sources that are deep and long, rooted in history, Right? Understanding that what we're experiencing right now is the repetition of things that have happened in the past. And we can learn from what happened in the past. Do we know our history, the history of the church, the history of the world? Rather than just being so caught up in the flavor of the moment, the flavor of the day. This is how you think deeply and carefully and discerningly about all of the craziness that's happening around us. It says at the end of this passage that the word of God increased and prevailed. The word of God increased and prevailed. The word of God has the greatest potential to change lives. That's, that's what we believe from the Christian frame, framework. That the word of God has the greatest potential to change lives. And the church is the mouthpiece of that word. And we need to recapture our voice right? So that we step out to fight for the things that matter out of a deep-rooted understanding of the kingdom of God and the values of the kingdom of God and the direction of the kingdom of God. That's what needs to be the source of our activity, collective and individual. And we've sacrificed that. It makes me so sad. People have pointed this out to me that, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s was, was birthed in the black church. That it was coming out of a, a deep connection to the scriptures and to the word of God. Right? So many of the movements that are afoot today need to be reconnected. We need to reconnect our work to the word of God so that it comes from the right place. Because without that, there will be no strength in it. There will be no power in it. The world needs the unsullied voice of the church. And that means that sometimes we're going to sound like, you know, if the world wants to say we're coming from the left. And sometimes we're going to sound like we're coming from the right. But we're not going to be, we're not going to be forced into either one of those sides. We're going to speak truth. We're not trying to sound like the right or the left. I hope you can hear my heart in this. I mean, part of the reason I tried to pull examples is because, number one, I felt like these were two powerful examples that illustrate this text and that are current in our day right now. And number two, I want to shake our attachment to the worldly categories and help us embrace the kingdom of God with boldness and creativity and conviction, and confidence. And I believe when we start to do that, we're going to step out. The church isn't going to, the world isn't going to recognize the church that emerges from that work. Because we're going to have a sort of a, a holy discontent with what's happening in our world. And we're going to be able to speak to it from a place of strength. But we have to go through our process of refinement. We've got to lay down our idols. Get rid of our attachments to things that are of the world and lay hold 
to God's word and to the kingdom and to the person of Jesus Christ, to a relationship with Jesus Christ that's vibrant and active and living in every day, rooted in repentance and renewal and refinement. We need to have hard conversations with one another. And we can do it in this place because we have Jesus holding us together, right? We're going to come to the communion table in a moment. And if you have problems coming to this table with somebody who has a different political view than you, you need to do business with that. Jesus is greater than everything else. Jesus is the reason we're in community. And let nothing separate that. And in this kind of season, when everything is so tumultuous and we're all off in our corners and we're figuring out on our own, I'm desperately concerned that we're going to come back together and find out that we've moved into incredibly different places and have no ability to be united. But you know what? Jesus is big enough to hold us together, to keep us one. And even, this is the beautiful, this is how learning takes place. This is how growth takes place. I submitted this sermon to a number of people um, and and there were a lot of critiques and, and what have you. And I learned from every single one of them. When we get into community where we have this kind of conversation, where we can go into the places that seem taboo or just seem so um, electrified and heated that we can't ever even talk about it and express our, our actual feelings about it and process, and so we're just trapped, we can't go anywhere with it. When we get into a community where that kind of thing can take place, it's amazing what will happen. The ability for us to really process this crazy world in light of Christ. That's what I dream for us. That's what I dream for us. But we've got to shake our attachments. We've got to have one primary attachment to Jesus and his kingdom. So God, help us to go there. Help us to recapture our voice. To be the voice of the kingdom of God in a world run amok with so many voices bellowing in every direction. Help us to attach ourselves to your word deeply. I believe and your scripture teaches that when the word is unleashed, it has power and that it it has the power to change lives. We don't have to be captured by any movement within our society that's not rooted in the gospel. We're captured by you, Jesus. We're captured by your heart. We're captured by your word. We're captured by your salvation. We're captured by your resurrection. We're captured by your Holy Spirit. We're captured by your kingdom. That's what we're captured by. And from that place, we speak critique and refinement and reformation into every facet of the world around us. And we speak hope and salvation into the world that's broken and hurting. And so we come to this communion table and we often take it so lightly. We just say, oh yeah, I can come to the communion table. Yeah, and especially when we're in our homes. But right now, today, as we come to this communion table, we wanna really ask the hard question. Am I willing to be in a community with people who view things differently with than me, whether that be on any spectrum? Am I willing to be in a community with people who are different from me in these ways? And, and am I willing to love them so much that I would give them the grace to have a hard conversation with them and, and, and in the end of that hard conversation to love them even if I disagree? Am I willing to go there And to trust that the love of Christ is greater than my frustration with somebody else's belief. Am I willing to create a space where maybe we can discover that we're not actually so different? That we actually agree on a lot of things at core and we maybe disagree on how to get it done. Can I create a space? Can we create a space where we can have real growth and learning and freedom to mess up and fail and say the wrong thing and just, you know, fumble along together to love each other in in the process. That's what this table's about. That's why it's so beautiful. So much yelling and hatred and killing 
over dis- disagreement. This table says it doesn't have to be that way. There's a different path. There's a different path to working out differences and to, to communicating across difficult lines. So God, meet us at this table. We, we're thankful that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Church family, I'm I'm just reminded that we need grace. I need grace. We need grace as we process a challenging world. I don't want us to just shove it all under the rug and, and pretend like we can figure it out on our own. We need each other. So come to this table today knowing um, that whatever sins you've committed, in whatever ways you've been wrong, in whatever ways you've hated, in whatever ways you've not been charitable, you have a Savior who loves so much that he's willing to take all of it into himself such that, such that you can be forgiven before God and before others and be given a fresh start to go back, to learn, to figure out, to grow, to struggle, to strive. This is the power of the gospel. And our world desperately needs it. I need it. You need it desperately right now. So God, meet us at this table. Remind us that this is a communion table. It's a table in which people who have different experiences, different backgrounds, come together and sit together and love one another across all those differences. So God, help us. Come to this table in truth today, being willing to extend grace to the other, being willing to love across borders and boundaries that this world continues to raise up between us and let the testimony of our communion and our unity together be something that awakens the world to the power of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.